Welcome everybody. I am James Tompkin. I'm an assistant professor at Brown University. I've been there about five years now. I thought I'd just start with a brief note about my growth, my personal growth through COVID. Uh, I started off looking much like this and over time have grown significantly as a person to be at this, you know, current, how can I say, state of significant length. Anyway, I, I hope everybody is uh, doing okay in lockdown and that you're all in good health. You know, I actually went through the same process of hair um, lengthening. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's it. No more. No more. <laughs> So I work in this area called visual computing, which is, you know, the, the intersection of graphics, vision and interaction. A lot of the problems that this group discusses are concerned with the machine learning aspects of how to do this graphics and vision. We also care about the, the interaction aspects too. So how can we make things, digital artifacts usually, as people and how can we build systems to allow us to uh, easily uh, manipulate or control uh, digital media. And that's uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, a lot of the work, I'll just give you a brief sense of the stuff that we do. A lot of the work that we do is about um, how we can build sort of editing tools for multi-view photographic media. So the lab works a lot with uh, light field cameras or uh, these powerful new multi-sensor systems that we have on the back of smartphones. We try and do uh, object editing uh, or scene editing. So uh, we try to do things like very accurate depth estimation from these camera platforms so that you can do uh, like very good object insertion. I'll just give you a sneak at this. So on the left there is, a, is a, actually a, a multi-view image from which we've derived depth. Uh, and then we stuck in this this new card on the on the middle there, this new sort of tarot card, and getting those edges right is uh, very difficult. On the right hand side there, we should be able to see that. Uh, oftentimes, when I try to estimate the depth of this scene, if I don't get the depth quite right, you can see that there's lots of sort of cruft that sneaks into this image along this boundary here or in the background, right? So we care about things like very, very accurate depth estimation so that you can do uh, realistic object insertion. Uh, like, like this. Okay, so one of our interests then is how to do multi-view editing and uh, scene reconstruction from cameras. But today we're gonna talk about uh, sort of a second channel of research in our lab, which we saw called learning control through structure for generating handwriting and images. And we're going to talk about three projects. Atsi is going to talk about the handwriting project, and then I'm going to talk about the, the, the imaging projects. And you might be saying, wow, that's a super generic title, <laughs> learning control through structure. Like, what does that mean? So let's try and expand this out a bit. So control, when we're creating media, right, we might be using a pen, a digital pen, or, or uh, some kind of analogy to that, to a brush. Uh, or we might be using a camera, or we might be working in the digital domain specifically, right, when we just talk about computer graphics. And when we talk about uh, control, we also talk about editing, right? Uh, maybe editing the shape of something or its appearance, even its motion or higher level operations to do with this, the style of the thing that I'm trying to make, right? And then structure, well, structure could come from semantic information, like what each particular element means of uh, a domain, uh, like handwriting or images, uh, or its function or taxonomies or hierarchies. Uh, but then there's also this idea of like how that media was formed in the first place. And you can think of this, especially when we're talking about images as like the physics uh, of how that image was formed or the process. Um, or for something like handwriting, it could be like a sequence over time. Uh, 
for images, maybe we talk about layering or blending or compositing, or when we talk about 3D scenes, we think about cameras and geometry and material and lighting and things like that. So control is what we want. We want to be able to manipulate all of these aspects of images. Um, and when we start from scratch, as in computer graphics, then we have our, our, our representations or our models of what the world should look like. And then we have a rendering algorithm uh, and we can edit those representations very easily because we defined them in the first place. But uh, when we have real world data, then we have to infer that structure that's going to provide us with uh, the control to be able to manipulate that data. So I go and capture an image with my camera and I get back a raster grid of pixels. And it's not particularly useful when I want these mid-level representations to be able to edit the thing. So I have to perform some kind of analysis. I have to infer uh, some useful control surfaces or models to be able to then reproduce that editing and creation interaction ability. Okay, but when we talk about these higher level things like style, sometimes we don't even know what the representation should be. It becomes very difficult to describe, uh, even as an expert, exactly what makes up how something appears to be. Uh, and for that, we often have to use different kinds of representations too. Okay. So we have to infer these mid-level representations. When we talk about machine learning, oftentimes we trade supervision or work supervising something uh, for control. Okay, so let's give you some examples. Imagine I was doing uh, image processing and I decided to label something with bounding boxes, right? I could draw where objects were with some bounding boxes. It's pretty cheap to label. But the label isn't that useful. It only gives me this vague idea of where something is. And I get this limited sort of derived control when I want to be able to edit something. Or I could do segmentations where I accurately draw the boundary around a particular object. It's still pretty fast, but a bit more expensive. Maybe you say it's sort of medium quality. It allows me to do some things in the 2D domain. Uh, so I gain some kind of derived control from that. Or I could go and like try to specify the 3D geometry of the thing which nobody does, and it's super time consuming, very expensive, but would give you the most control over the final edit. Right? So we have this trade of how much time I spend supervising something versus the control that I get back. And what we're going to show you today is how we can use unsupervised techniques and then what you might call like semi-supervised or self-supervised, uh, depending on how much label data we use, um, to structure our problem to be able to bypass these kinds of supervisions. So I want my bounding boxes or my segmentations or my geometries to be implicitly formed from the problem that I'm going to set up and try and solve. And uh, sometimes this is called self-supervision. When I'm talking about neural representations of things, oftentimes this is called like disentanglement uh, or decoupling. Uh, these are the words that we use to describe this. Okay, so the goal is to try and get as much control as we can over the, the real world media uh, by structuring the underlying problem that we solve in our uh, machine learning to then give us uh, this, this power to edit and, uh, and control what's going on. So Atsu's gonna describe from here uh, his work on applying these ideas to handwriting. And here we have uh, a set of sort of latent neural representations uh, that we're going to provide some, some explicit semantic information to the system about, and it's going to give us back this control over uh, uh, style via interpolation. Uh, and then I will talk about some of our work in image processing to do with unsupervised estimation of segmentation maps and then how to go even further and do unsupervised estimation of things like pose and camera and uh, some sense of lighting estimation too. So I'm gonna to turn over to Atsu. 
I will stop sharing my screen. Do you all see my screen now? Looks good, Edson. So for this part, uh, I will introduce our paper, Generating Handwriting via Decoupled Style Descriptors by me, Atsunobu Kutani, Stephanie, Professor Stephanie Tellex, and Professor James Tompkin from Brown University Computer Science Department. Well, a little bit about myself. I graduated from Brown as an, under, as an undergrad last year. I'll be starting my PhD at UC Berkeley this fall. Yep. So reproducing fine details in handwriting requires precise preservation of a writer's style. In our paper, we will introduce a new approach to model styles of online handwriting. Uh, producing computational models of handwriting is a deeply human and personal topic. Most people can write and each writer has a unique style to their script. Capturing these styles flexibly and accurately is important as it determines the space of descriptive expression of any computational model. For deep learning based models, our concern is how to architecture the neural network such that we can represent the underlying stroke characteristics of the styles of writing. But once we have a representation, then this lets us generate new writing in the style recovered from a previously unseen target sample of writing. Techniques have synthesized handwriting from pixel samples. And this example, uh, the goal is to generate a drawing of she from a sample of his. As two characters, H and S, are common, these approaches extract specific regions and place them to look like a word. There are also approaches to generate handwriting from features learned by neural networks, such as latent style vectors. Um, Pixel-based pixel approaches are scalable as their performance improves with more reference samples which provide more variations in generated results. Current latent vector approaches use variational recurrent neural networks to learn latent representations of handwriting styles and shows effectiveness in generating a drawing of a character absent from the reference sample. However, pixel approaches cannot generate missing characters or interpolate between styles and latent representation often lose fine details. The approach of treating handwriting style as a unified property of a sequence can limit the representation of both character and writer level features. This includes specific character details being averaged out to maintain overall writer style and um, reduced representation space of writing styles. In other words, the problem with current methods is that there's no explicit separation of writer style from character style. For instance, for character style H, the letter H can be written with or without a loop, where we see the one on the slide here with the loop. And for writer style, H could be large or small or slanted or squarer. Our approach, by contrast, learns to decouple writer and character style into specific vectors such that we have both a character independent style vector for each writer for any unsampled subsequences, as shown as magenta dot and character specific latent style vectors if we are given those samples, these green and blue squares. Our objective is to train neural networks which output a writer independent character style representation C. And 
a character independent general handwriting style representation of a writer, W. However, our only input is a sequence character labels and a set of strokes that are the handwriting. And this handwriting already couples the writer and character styles. So we must learn to decouple them somehow. To do this, we introduce the coupled style descriptors or DSDs, which is designed to decouple style representations. In our handwriting setting, we assume writer style and character style are linear. Here's a high level diagram. The input character label H is transformed into character DSD matrix C of H. This then is multiplied by the character independent general writer style writer DSD W to produce the instantiation of that character written by that writer, which we name W of H uh, and also known as writer character DSD. This happens through learned LSTM encoders G and F. And we predict character DSD matrix C from a character label and writer character DSD from a sequence of points. Um, because character DSD is an invertible matrix to recover the writer style W from a pair of character DSD and writer character DSD, we can simply invert the matrix. Intuitively, a matrix multiplication either injects or ejects character information from a latent vector. Now, once we have obtained the writer DSD, we can generate arbitrary text with it. Um, we are of course aware that some of you might wonder if character DSD is really invertible in our practice. The answer is yes, uh, by adding a loss term to implicitly guide character DSD to be invertible, we had no trouble assuming the invertibility of character DSD. And this equation of one of our loss terms, L of alpha for W of C of T, um, this is non zero if the matrix C is not invertible. Um, so W of C of one is in this case, writer character DSD, but this doesn't really matter. Think of it as a constant vector and focus on the part underlying in red. To minimize the loss function, this part should be identity matrix and implicitly guide C matrix to be invertible. And yet this does not fully guarantee C matrix to be always invertible even during, tra during training. In our experiments, this has, this has never been an issue. Uh, in other words, C matrix has never been non invertible even during the training, as long as we initialize the value well. Uh, this decoupling retains more fine details in the handwriting and allows few shot learning of new characters and writer identification. Uh, so let's go over the model architecture. At the core of our design, as highlighted in blue, we have an LSTM-based O encoder similar to the work by Alex Graves. Uh, this is a very simple problem to solve as you, as you see. We can simply aim to minimize the reconstruction loss for the input sequence. Our model builds upon this simple architecture. As we have already seen, two parameterized function approximators F of theta encoder and G of theta transforms an input sequence of points and a character label into a writer character DSD vector and a character DSD matrix. We then compute the inverse of that predicted character DSD matrix and multiply it with writer character DSD to filter out character information. When a writer DSD is multiplied with the original character DSD, we inject character information and reconstruct the writer character DSD. And with the sequence decoder, F of theta decoder, 
we can reconstruct the drawing from writer character DSD vectors. For a new drawing synthesis, the writer DSD produces a new writer character DSD when multiplied with another predicted character DSD matrix for a new character. Yeah, so this is the high level overview of our model architecture. Yep. So now let's go over how we extract writer DSD. Uh, oops. It's not playing right. Uh, we see a black screen right now, a black slide number 28. Okay, uh, give me a sec. Hmm. Did this just stop? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, give me a sec. Sorry, everyone. No worries, no worries. this so do you see it now it helps yes. out. looks good i see so as we know online handwriting data is sequential unlike offline handwriting data which is just a static image and to extract relevant information we use lscm like as you see it now and it is important to note here that for each point in the sequence, we have a corresponding binary label for the end of each character. In our paper, we describe how we architecture the segmentation network to extract this end of character label, EOC, in short, in unsupervised manner. But as it is not directly related to the main focus of our paper, handwriting synthesis, Please just assume that this EOC label is given by default and it's also included in our data set. Um, and the encoded vector at this location highlighted in red, in fact, what is what, what we call writer character DSD, these three rectangles uh, uh, vectors. Uh, this should makes sense intuitively as well as LSCM is unidirectional. This middle writer character DSD, W of HI, contains information about how this writer would write two character H and I in order. Likewise, we have another network that encodes a character sequence. Note that the inputs are actually one hot vectors um from all possible characters in the data set and not the actual drawing of characters these are just uh latin alphabets and this character encoder has a similar network with the sequence encoder on the left except the final output is a matrix in this case unlike a vector sequence uh, a vector for sequence encoder as we've already seen, we then take the inverse um, of these matrices and to extract the writer DSD, we multiply this inverse matrix with a relevant vector of a writer character DSD to get the mean writer DSD, okay? Okay. 
So for our experiments, we take the mean average of these rider DSDs. And during training, we also penalize the variance in the rider DSDs. Uh, in this case, these three white boxes. This is because we would like our model to output exactly the same rider DSD from any drawings of the rider of the same rider. Uh, we understand that this is quite surreal as even the same writer can write the same word differently. And yet we found this lost term is quite useful to maintain the consistency of synthesis results. We understand that this is right. So like this part is our, our lost term to make sure these three uh, writer DSD candidate keeps low variance. So writing is complex with cursive character pairs, ligatures and delayed strokes. No single character model can easily represent these. And in the right previous diagrams, we use a single character, but in truth, our LSTM encoder function G represents not only a single character, but also a character string. Thus for the word his, his, we will have a C matrix for substrings H, HI, and HIS. Um, this is also true as we just saw for the writer character DSD, WH, WHI, and WHIS, as input drawings can contain multiple characters. Uh, from a drawing of three character HIS, we will obtain three writer character DSDs, WH, WHI, and WHIS, as you see in the figure with the uh, F theta and quarter. We then multiply it with their corresponding character DSD matrices, and this will create the candidates for the writer DSD, W1, W2, W3. Okay. Given the mean writer DSE W bar, we then reconstruct the target writer character DSD for generation. First predict writer, uh, character DSD matrices for um, HIS, uh, C of H, C of HI, C of HIS, and multiply them with W bar to create writer character DSD WH, WHI, and WHIS. We then generate a stroke sequence with, with F theta decoder from this set of vectors. However, we can also extract writer character DSDs from a single character if drawing is known cursive. Single character writer character DSDs such as W of H, W of I, and W of S in this figure are good representations as they're sufficiently few compared to all possible words. Also, um, we can save them in a database and use them to synthesize a new sample if the character is present in the target text. With these uh, writer character DSD for substrings, uh, we can reconstruct writer character DSDs for generation by restoring temporal dependencies among them with LSTM shown as a green rectangle. Um, upon successful training of these two methods, we can combine them and generate a high quality drawings in the runtime. Let us assume we have a reference drawing of known cursive HIS, his, and aims to generate a drawing of chi. Uh, we first compute the mean W from pairs of writer character DSD and character DSD, predict the writer character DSD for a missing character E. And as two characters, H and S are common, and his and she, we extract two single character writer character DSD, W, S, and W, H. Finally, we feed them into LSTM and restore temporal dependencies. The first row of the writing, the quick brown box, is the original drawing by a writer. And this is our target to generate. 
And the second row and the third row of seven word level samples are our reference samples by the same writer. As several characters in the target, se target sentence, the quick brown fox exists in these reference samples, we retrieve relevant writer character DSDs and these are highlighted in colors. The three characters Q and C and W are missing from reference samples. So we compute the mean writer DSDs from reference samples and then multiply it with character DSD matrices to obtain writer character DSDs for these missing characters. Uh, the rest of the synthesis process is just what we saw in the previous slides. Uh, with another layer of LSCM, we combine these different writer character DSDs to achieve smooth drawing results. Um, okay, let's take a look at more results. Um, these are generated by, uh, by our trained model. To generate handwriting samples, our model used 10 reference samples by the same writer. Without ever seeing the target drawing, both of our methods generate high quality samples while preserving fine details. They, there is a slight improvement in quality with our sampling method as it saves writer character DSD in a database. When a writer character DSD for a certain substring in the target text exists in the database, it's highly likely to succeed in generating accurate transitions from one character to another. Um, when compared against the state-of-the-art model in online handwriting synthesis, our results were preferred 88% of the time. Not only the overall size of the handwriting, but also connections between characters and unique drawings of certain characters are well preserved. Our style representation can be interpolated between two drawings. Here we have two sample drawing of rhythm by two writers. From each sample, we can compute the mean writer, mean writer DSD W and mix them together to obtain a new writer DSD. We can observe a style, style of drawing slowly changes from one to another by altering the mix ratio. As two source drawings are non-cursive, we can also sample writer character DSDs for each character. We mix them in a similar manner to create a new writer character DSD, which will be then fed into another LSTM and sequence decoder. As this is an interpolation at a single character level, excuse me, the style transition is relatively smoother than the previous example. Finally, we can also interpolate at character DSD level in these, exper uh, in these ex experiments, uh, we compute full character DSDs for full characters and construct a new C matrix. Writer DSD is fixed in this interpolation and we reconstruct writer character DSD from a new C matrix and the writer DSD. From this set of experiments, we show our style space is very smooth. Uh, a linear relationship between these uh, three DSD, three types of DSDs, lets us to perform future learning of new characters. We first excluded samples, including numerical letters from our data set, and train a model prior to this, this experiment. We then provide a few drawing samples of numbers to the model and predict writer character DSD for these letters. Assuming the writer of numerical letters also provided other Roman alphabet samples, which allow us to predict writer DSD W. The pairs of writer character DSD and writer DSD allows us to predict the character DSD and the figure shows the results. As we provide more samples per new character, the quality improves as you see, but the predicting a, a good character DSD from a single sample remain 
difficult. However, we can observe stylistic differences in the generated samples, such as the character four in 100 samples um, prediction. To examine how well our model might represent the latent distribution of handwriting styles, we perform a writer, recon writer recognition task on our trained model on the randomly selected 20 writer hold out set from the data set. Uh, first, we compute 20 writer DSDs from 10 sentence level samples. Then for testing, we sample from one to 50 new word level strokes sequences per writer and calculate the corresponding writer DSDs. This is basically uh, compute the writer DSD for each drawing and try to figure out who wrote that uh, sentence or word. Our test prediction accuracy rises from 89.2% for one word sample to 99.7% for 50 word samples. This is an indication that our latent space is usefully descriptive. We are also releasing a new data set for online hunt writing, which we named the brush data set. It is comprised of handwritten strokes in the Latin alphabets, which includes 170 writers, 86 characters, 488 common words written by all writers, and 3,668 rare words written across writers. Uh, right. Further, our drawing samples are segmented into characters. Um, common word samples and character le level labels are not present in the previous IM online handwriting data set. So to summarize, uh, we discussed our paper generating handwriting via decouple style descriptors. DSDs decouple character style from writer style and allow flexible handwriting generation. We also briefly introduced the new brush data set for online handwriting. We have shown explicit and structural style decoupling process work better than the previous implicit decoupling process in our handwriting domain. And the idea of DSD could be applied to other sequential data with style variations such as speech and motion capture data. Yep, so that's it for my part. And code and data set has not been released yet, but it will be soon. And the website is, yep, dsd.cs.brown.edu. So. Thank you. Thanks, Asu. Do you want to leave that slide up? This is a great pause point. Actually, we're now at quarter two. So um, does anybody have any questions about um, handwriting or about the particular method of um, decomposing the style and the content? Uh, yeah, I have. I don't see in the meantime in the chat, but I have. It was a, a bit hard, hard to follow. It was a lot of mathematical annotations, but hopefully I understood stuff right. And if not, please correct me. Um, I think about 10 slides back, you talked about sampling and you, you mentioned how you do whew, handwriting reconstruction um, without sampling and with sampling. This, yeah. Okay. This, uh, this part also will come back, but two slides forward. A bit more, I think. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't understand what was the sampling process done here. You've okay, mentioned something so, with database and searching the database. Um, I couldn't follow. Right. It. So, right. Good question. Um, so, this sampling process is basically let's assume you have um, 10 word level reference samples uh, on your hand and your target, you also have at the target word um, sequence that you wish to generate. And let's say the word is hello. And 
it is quite likely that the letter H or letter E could be also found in your reference samples. So this sampling a method is basically take all your reference samples, break it into each character or character string pairs and save it in the database. And when you see the target, when you have the target letter or target word you wish to generate, mm -hmm. you first access to the database and to see if the, the same ca character was found in the reference samples. And if it's not, it needs to be generated from global writer DSD, but if it was found in the database, just take it from the database. So that's the difference between the global DSD and the sampling method. I don't know if it's it's not really a good explanation, but that's... Um, no, no, actually, I think it's good. just, if I can repeat it in my words, just to see if I understand. So in the global DSD, we might not have all the characters during training time. If I'm saying it right, even during training time, I want to go back to it, but let's say, during training time, we might not have the, let's say the letter H. And we now right. need to generate the word hello. So we say, okay, so we can use the global DSD and that's the first line. Second line says, maybe somewhere else we do have the letter H, but why wasn't it present then during training? Like what's, what's the use case or what's the situation where you have something in sampling, but you didn't have it in training when you were calculating global DSD? Maybe that's the question. Mm. Maybe I can take this one. So uh, think of it like there being a learned latent space of handwriting, yeah. uh, which you learned from training, from reference samples. Right? Uh, and then at test time, I get to see some new sample, uh, which uh, isn't necessarily from mm. the, the, the training corpus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? OK, I understand now. Yeah. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> Very simple. Yeah. Great. Um, another question now, because while you were talking, I was trying to think the mathematics, but but if you could explain, maybe it'll be easier. Um, why is there a character matrix and uh, and uh, and a character dependent DSD vector? Why was why is one considered a matrix, the other a vector? What was the reason to choose this specific representation and terminology? Um, that's also a good question as well. Uh, Atsi, do you want to bring up the slide? Maybe the end slide has it on. Oh, yeah. Maybe this one? Yeah. Yeah, that works. So uh, when I first came up with this idea, I focused on the invertibility of mat mat matrix. Uh, so by multiplying it with the vector, I try to conceptualize this as injecting or ejecting information from a vector. Oh, yeah. So that's why the C matrix needed to be a matrix form. Mm -hmm. By taking inverse, I was hoping to, when it multiplied with the vector, you can inject or eject information. Mm -hmm. Is that that's your, your question? So, yeah. That's nice. Um, and, and another things. interpretation of this, which might be interesting, is that matrix multiplication is like um, a, a large fully connected layer of a neural network. Uh, because I'm just doing dot products between some some neuron, which is one in one of the, the rows of the matrix, and then the column vector that comes in, which is the, the input to the neural network. So another way that you could interpret this diagram is that I have uh, two sets of like two neural networks, if you like, one is the, the mathematical inverse of the other that, that transform me from these spaces. Yeah. By the way, that's interesting. And uh, now that you're mentioning it, um, this comes also to my next question. Um, we have a character encoder, which I, it was a bit hard to follow, but I guess this is a neural network by itself, right? Right. Um, and it creates this the C matrix, and this C matrix you saw in testing that is usually is inversible um, on real life uh, situations. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, 
why should it really, why should it generate a C matrix? Why not use an encoder that gets, that gets, uh, that, that gets the W vector as an input and then outputs the, the result of that multiplication of the C and the W. And then you can use the same, like the same encoder, but switch the direction of calculations, right? And, and use that as the inverse. I'm, I'm hoping I'm making sense with my question. Um, that's, a, that's a valid interpretation. Uh, yeah. You can think of it as, yes, we're doing that. It's just that the network is shallow and wide through through the interpretation of the C matrix as the weights uh -huh. of, a, of okay. a neural network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically those multiplications by themselves, it's like it's 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 like a layer in the neural network. You just yeah, yeah, yeah. represent it differently yeah. here. Okay. And and they're all trained, right? The, the the matrix is predicted to be the one that best satisfies the learning problem that's posed. Yeah. Mm. Mm, nice. Nice. Okay, that was that. And and another thing about the training process, if you could repeat that, I was again. I'm sorry about this, but a bit hard to understand. How was the yeah, training done for the G and the F um, encoders? G and F encoders. Yeah, and then, um, of course the decoders. Um... Right. So. Um... Everything was actually encoded this G of theta, F of theta encoder, uh, F of theta decoder is all trained simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And the main term in our loss function is the reconstruction loss. So what we hope for is given the set of label and input drawings, we wish to reconstruct this X uh, to be very similar to the input drawings by minimizing the differences between the reconstructed drawing and the original drawing. Mm. We hope to um, these three parameterized function to play a role that we specify. Um, so by, and also another term would be as I briefly touched, oh, sorry. Um, right, we of course want to minimize uh, the variance for our writer DSD. Yeah. And everything is basically trained simultaneously and it just, works the main part would be the reconstruction loss uh, that the l of w that you showed there this is per writer right per writer uh-huh and, I mean, and like, that t that t is the stroke sequence right that's there's a lot of annotations so it was a bit tricky to follow if we can return to that black slide <clears throat> yeah so that sum of t the t is the is the stroke sequence right uh, actually, T is like in this case W of one and W of two and W of three. Uh -huh. So, okay, okay, yeah. And now we we are we are doing an average pair writer for all the different Ws, but <laughs> there's but there's no annotation of a writer here. It's like the same W for all writers, if I understand. Hey, think uh, of it no, like it's actually within a writer. So ah, this is within a writer. This okay. loss within the writer and a writer. Let's say like I wrote. Uh, a sentence and okay. that would produce several candidates of W. Mm -hmm. Like th in this case, it has three W candidates mm -hmm. and we compute the mean of W bar and we want to minimize the variance. So what I'm saying is we, I always want my writing to have a very similar my style representation. Okay, but you have several writers and how do you combine? Is it like a just summation of the loss across the different writers and that's it, but we just don't see the annotation? That's the only thing or something uh, else is happening? Yeah, that's right. In terms of the loss, that happens that happens implicitly. So, so W is a latent space. Yeah. So every writer has 
some style in in W, and that just that just happens implicitly through the training. Hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. I think now I understand. Okay. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions in the chat. Nobody was asking. I hope um, people were able to follow. Please uh, let us know if you have questions. Um, otherwise, we will continue. I think no. So, guys, we can continue on. Thank you. Thank you, Ozzy. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about images, and I will... I don't think I have any equations in this one. So hopefully it should be easier to follow along with. Let me just get my screen. It set. could be easier, it could be harder. It depends on the <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Okay. All right, does everybody see my screen again? Yes, we see it. Perfect. Okay, so we have to, okay, so we're gonna move into the, the domain of images now. Okay, and I'm gonna try and talk about uh, a line of work that tries to build generative models for, for images. Okay. When we think about generative models for Images, you might think of StyleGAN. StyleGAN is like the most classic uh, and brilliant example of a generative model for faces. Right? And it uses this very high quality data set called FFHQ, which was captured from Flickr users. Um, this is an example of the data set. Uh, for training its face generator, StyleGAN uses 70,000 images. They're all pre-processed such that all of the eyes align uh, and the scale is the same. The object is approximately in the middle of the frame under this like complex but relatively simple uh, face you know, geometry variants. Faces are unique and distinctive, but actually they all share quite similar features. So generative models for faces, very good, right? Very, very good. This line of work started with the, the thought that uh, what, what would we need to be able to generate images for more complicated data sets? So we looked at this data set called uh, COCO. COCO stands for Common Objects in Context, or Open Images. Right? Uh, we took one class, we looked at the giraffe class. Okay, what if you could build a generative model for giraffe, right? And here's some examples of images of giraffe from uh, Coco. So first off, there's far fewer of them. Uh, they are under much more complex pose variation. Uh, they have occlusion, they have varying backgrounds, they have like scene composition. Uh, some of them, unfortunately, aren't even real images. This one of a giraffe on the back of another giraffe is definitely not a real image. Um, so when we think about all of the like the variation that is in this kind of data set with respect to the FFHQ data set, there is significantly more, and you also have less data, right? And what this means is that to be able to build a generative model for this kind of data, I have to cope with many more like factors of variation. I have to be able to cope with the background. I have to be able to cope with the lighting, the pose of the scene, sorry, the pose of the object, like, you know, its legs, its neck, things like that. Um, so we're going to go on a journey through a few different papers. Uh, where we try to factor this variation at a high level. Okay, we're going to start with trying to separate the object from the background. And we're going to try and do this in an unsupervised way. So I don't have any labeling for any of the things that I want to try to factor, right? So my goal is to, to try to build unsupervised ways 
of learning the, the control structures uh, and this kind of factorization it, to be able to cope with all of this additional variation. Does everybody know the, uh, the image to image translation problem where I have one domain uh, like uh, X I here and another domain Y I and my goal is to go from one domain to the next, right? Uh, and you can even have an unpaired version, right? Where I have just a general domain X uh, and a general domain Y or source and target, we also call them. Uh, and I want to be able to go from like photographs to paintings, something like that, right? Um, and this is a very famous example from John Yang Zhu and Philip Sola uh, from ICCV a few years ago, where they managed to accomplish something like this, right? And the general approach was to, to do this double GAN approach. And this was also discovered by uh, Kim et al. Uh, called Disco GAN. So this one uh, from Zhang Yanzhu is Cycle GAN, and then Disco GAN came out at the same time and does the same thing. So I have a domain uh, S, and I have a domain T, and I have examples from those. And I say that. Uh, I have this double GAN, I have some GAN that takes me from domain T into domain S, and then I have, that's G, and then I have another uh, sort of trans transformation network that takes me from domain S back into domain T, and that's F. And then I want to discriminate on the, the source domain and the target domain, so I have two discriminators, S and T. And the reason that this cycle works is that I say when I have some image in S, this yellow ball here, and I apply F to it, it takes me into the domain T. So I go from photos to paintings. So here I am in the paintings domain. And then I do uh, the operation of G and it takes me back into the source domain again. And I want to minimize the distance between the images when they come through. Right? And this is sufficient to train the, train the network in a completely unsupervised way with unpaired examples. And obviously I do the same for uh, uh, the backwards path as well. Okay, so this is great, but it doesn't really work very well for domains where you have an object of interest. Okay, so here's the, excuse me, zebra to horses example, right? I want to take the domain of horses and turn them into zebras. And you can see that everything is quite messed up. And it's not just the horses that have changed. The, the domain of the background region has also changed, right? The model doesn't know anything about the distinction between the foreground and the background in any particular uh, image, right? And so the domain of horses, which used to be in these fields of lavender, has also changed into the domain of uh, maybe the savanna with this drier yellow grass, right? Okay, so this makes sense because the model doesn't know anything about the distinction between uh, the foregrounds and the backgrounds within the domain, right? But our goal is to be able to separate these two objects out, the foreground and the background, uh, and do so in a way that provides me with a source of uh, a segmentation. So here's uh, our results in comparison. So I have been able to transfer you know, most of just the foreground without affecting the background in this horses to zebras example. And in this lion to tiger example, I've also been able to concentrate most of the change in just the, just the foreground. Okay. So how do we do this? And why is this the same thing as unsupervised segmentation detection? So let's go back to our cycle GAN diagram, right? Uh, what we're going to do is introduce an image formation model into this task. We're going to structure this task to make it produce us 
the segmentation maps that we want to be able to separate the foreground and the background. So instead of just F and G, uh, this was what I used to be G, right? Uh, where I go from the source domain to the target domain, I'm going to additionally introduce another network, AS, where A is like attention. It's like attention of the domain. Uh, and it's going to learn to generate uh, a segmentation mask that is going to separate out the two domains. Now, I don't have any supervision for this. So all I'm going to say is that the foreground and the background are separated by this model here. What does this model say? It says that uh, SA, which is this segmentation mask, when I dot it with uh, the image, uh, I'm going to then add it to one minus SA to represent the background. And this should be, sorry, that should be a T there from the other domain. So I want to take the background from the other domain, but just the foreground from the first domain. Here's a visual example of that. So if I had Zebra as my data set, I want SA to look like just the parts that were zebras. And then one minus SA is the part that looks just like the background. Okay. And in the image, the simple image reconstruction task, if I if I add this to this, I will get back this. Okay. Now you might think uh, this like cannot possibly work. <laughs> How on earth does this just somehow magically learn to segment the objects? So let's look at a bit more detail. So an image comes in and it gets passed into the attention generator and that's going to produce SA. Right? And then I'm going to dot those together to produce my foreground region. Then I'm going to transfer the foreground into the source into the target domain. So now into the domain of horses. It's going to look something like this. Uh, and then I'm going to strip out all of the crap that has learned uh, in the regions I don't care about so that I get back something that is just the horses. And then I'm going to take the background from the original input image. Uh, and then I'm going to add these together. Uh, and then I'm going to discriminate that within the source, excuse me, within the target domain. Right? So the discriminator DT is now saying, does this look like horses? Okay. So the attention map and the transfer function are both trained to fool this discriminator DT. And I enforce cycle consistency the other way around as well. Okay. So how does this work? Uh, if SA is all ones, then it looks like cycle gain because SA is just, just blank. Right? And everything gets taken from the, the foreground. And if, if SA is all zeros, then nothing gets taken from the transferred domain. And I don't fool the discriminator. Okay. AS must focus on the parts that the discriminator thinks are important for it to be translated into the target domain. And the parts that are most distinctive within the target domain are the, are the foreground parts. So what is most horse-like about the horse domain? It's the horses, it's not the backgrounds, right? The backgrounds vary a lot. The thing that is more consistent is the horses themselves. And so the, to fool the discriminator, AS will learn to segment the horses automatically as the most salient parts to fool the discriminator. That's it. That's all you have to do. So all we have done is introduce a little bit of structure into the problem, and we have gained this unsupervised segmentation. Any questions at this point? No, nice trick. It's cute. So here's, here's why it kind of works, and here's why it kind of doesn't work. Okay, so I've, I've shown you the 
you know, the big act, and now I'm going to pull the curtain back. And you can see the, the stage works. All right, so we're trying to make an image that, that, or rather we're trying to make an image domain that doesn't exist, right? We're trying to say that there is this hybrid domain of just the foregrounds of the source and, sorry, just the foregrounds of the target and just the backgrounds of the source, but it doesn't really exist, right? So I don't have any real images to discriminate against. But I still have to fool a discriminator, right? The discriminator gets to look at the whole image. Uh, we only really want it to look at the foreground, um, but I still have to train these things separately. I don't know what the foreground is ahead of time. I have this complex chicken and egg problem, right? So uh, this is where it gets uh, a little bit hacky. For the first 30 epochs during the training, uh, the discriminator gets to see the whole image. And we use this to train our attention generator. And then at some point we say the attention generator is trained sufficiently. And then the discriminator gets to only see the foreground. Okay, so it's like uh, her teaching, having this period where you teach the network what is most discriminative uh, to the discriminator. Uh, and then you say, that's sufficient. Now I'm going to uh, train the rest of the, the network. And here's the progress through that. So given the input, this is what you see as sort of the, the training of that segmentation. And at about 30 epochs, this is why we picked 30, it, it looks pretty good. Um, but as I keep going, the attention generator learns to focus on things that are like slightly less discriminative about the domain, but still discriminative to some extent. Uh, and then it introduces, you know, at 70 epochs more of the background, right? But you can think of it as saying, the things that are going to most fool the discriminator most early in training are the foregrounds. And so at some point during training, I, I will stop and I will just have the foregrounds. And it works okay. Um, sometimes it fails on more complicated domains, but uh, in general, it, it works pretty well to segment foregrounds in an unsupervised way. You can see that it still bleeds, right? Some of the, oops, sorry. Some of the examples here, are like pars and the second uh, second column, for instance, uh, because this is a soft, we can't really train a binary mask. We have to train a, a floating point mask. Some of that zebra stripe is still coming through, but um, it helps significantly to separate the, the foreground from the background. Okay, any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to keep going in our journey to trying to cope with more variation. The discriminator gets to see uh, Aaron. Thanks we for the have, question. We have a question here from Arun. Uh, do you think it makes sense to provide a discriminator to have access of the attention mask? Yeah, so after 30 epochs, in training, the discriminator only gets to see the part that is attended to. So it implicitly gets to see, gets access to the attention mask. Um, if you had like a, a more explicit version, um, like the attention mask gets passed into the discriminator explicitly as an additional channel, uh, Good question. There's there's no supervision on attention, so I don't know what it would do with that. But we're sort of uh, pre-applying it after thirty ebooks. Yeah. Just a short question. Uh, so, but uh, you don't break symmetry between two domains, if I understand correctly, because you thought something that. Uh, because you have a uh, segmentation mask from uh, like from one domain to another one, but uh, actually you train uh, symmetrically, like, uh, okay. Uh, so it's not broken. Uh, that's right. You could try and train separate attention generators for each domain. Yeah, in the horse to zebra case, they share the same, like horses and zebras have the same shape, if you like. Um, but we have separate, I think we still have separate attention generators for those two domains because they have different appearance. Um, yeah. 
uh, just a question, maybe stupid, but uh, when you already created such images uh, with, uh, with another background, can you use it once again during training or it will be weird? Oh, um, you're much more likely to overfit if you do that. So, so we don't do that. These are all test examples that we're showing on the slides. Yeah, so the, the network never got to see these during the training. But uh, to, to, uh, for not overfitting, you can also mix if you want. Yeah, right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Anne. Okay, so I will keep going. So we started with just, just a bunch of images and we ended up being able to segment approximately to be able to segment the, the foreground objects using this, this, this trick of applying the structure into the, the model that performs the task. Okay. So now what can we do with that? Uh, we're going to move on to our uh, sort of second section. And we call this like generative, like object stamps. So this is, this is to say, now that I've got segmentation, could I, could I make sort of like a super clip art? Could I make like a, 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 a generator for objects that exploits this, this segmentation mask? So the setup is that I now have at training time, this database of images of an object, and I now have instance level masks, okay? And I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm, we're actually going to take the instance level masks that have been created in the data set in the first place. So these were these were hand drawn by human beings. And so they're better than the ones that we can generate from the unsupervised technique. But but this is the, the conceptual thread that runs through the work. Right? And you can see some examples of them there. And what I want to be able to do is have this sort of 2D generator for, for these objects, even when I have this complicated uh, complicated data. So I want to somehow be able to factor out the background, somehow have a model for the shape, uh, somehow have a model that's separate for uh, the texture or the lighting to, to be able to control each of them independently, okay? And the reason that I describe this as like super clip art is because what we want to be able to do is have the user drag a bounding box over some user provided background and then generate an object from that class to fit the, the bounding box, but then also the to approximately fit into the scene with the with the lighting. Right? And then as much as possible, we want to be able to provide control over things like shape variation or texture variation. Uh, when I place this object into the scene. This is hard because the data set has this significant amount of variation. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that is very hard for, for artists to do themselves, right? To generate an object instance from a particular class. I have to be able to do this right. I have to match the perspective, the illumination, okay? But, uh, Modern networks are very powerful, and even with small amounts of data, I can do reasonable things, right? I only had 3,000 images, but I can still do some reasonable things. So, so this is one of our generated instances. The user has dragged the bounding box and created the giraffe uh, across uh, a control for illumination that we're going to be able to provide. We can have a different shape and different texture appearance for a particular background. And then if I vary the backgrounds and add in a few other, you know, animals, uh, then I get this kind of like this super clip art style thing where instead of there being a giraffe that you get to drag over your, you know, PowerPoint presentation, you, you have this generator of giraffes that provides you these, what we call object stems. So, so how does this work? We have to be able to exploit this segmentation that we just provided, right? So we start off with this database of training images and also the image that we're going to provide at 
inference time or an example of one, which is going to be our background, right? And we say that from this uh, IB subscript image, which is the, the original image in the training set for the zebra class uh, without the zebra in it, I want to generate some kind of mask that is going to be able to fill the space in some plausible way, right? It has to be an instance of the shape of that particular class. And then I'm going to take that mask and generate some texture that is going to be able to fill in the zebra as a convincing instance of that particular object. And so at training time, uh, I can perform some kind of reconstruction loss on the original image i and its generated image i s hat at the end, uh, such that at inference time, I can then, here's my generated image, at inference time, I can then drag some bounding box over some bit of space in any image in which there was no zebra uh, and reconstruct uh, a plausible looking zebra or giraffe. Okay. So this is a kind of uh, exploitation of this additional supervision that we have because I factored the problem into two, just the shape, if you like, as this mask, uh, and then just the texture. And to provide some control over these, uh, we have like an, an edit in injector for sampling different shapes. So there's like, a, imagine in the interface, there's a button you click to say, no, give me a different shape, give me a different shape, give me a different shape. Uh, and we discriminate uh, loss, uh, use an adversarial loss to discriminate the quality of these masks. And then on the texture side, uh, we again have uh, texture control over the appearance through this edit and injected noise. Uh, and then we also have sort of a background conditioner that says that the approximate lighting of the background must match to be able to produce a convincing insertion of an object into the scene. Okay, uh, so at a high level, we have managed to accomplish this or use this kind of uh, factorization of the shape and texture to produce these uh, object stamps and condition them on some background image such that the user can pull up their own favorite picture of the savannah and drag and drop some different animal shapes to populate the scene. I'm going to pause here and ask if there are any questions, because then we're going to move on to like the super version of this. So can, can I ask a few questions? In fact? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, so some of the part I was busy with my cat, sorry, but uh, at least I understood that you need a uh, weak supervision and this is like a cropping uh, region that is like a devout object. But in fact, uh, uh, if you combine uh, these two works, you could say that if you have, uh, you, you really can create uh, these uh, regions because using your first paper, because in your first paper you already have some masks. You, you can use this domain uh, uh, domain adaptation trick uh, really to find uh, regions that are without objects. Right. You could even not uh, really uh, give this. Uh, it's, it's enough like to apply the first paper to get this uh, like weak annotation. And combine these two papers and uh, not asking users uh, uh, to, to give you these masks. Yeah, that might be possible. Yeah, um, and, and then I'm going back to my first question because in, in the first question, so how it was important just getting uh, images that uh, had similarity because it was uh, horses to, to zebra, but let's say if instead of horses, it was not for, uh, zebra but something else like elephant uh, yeah. really talk. so how it is important that there is like this uh, object similarity yeah that's a great question 
Um, the answer is it's actually quite important. So we tried the experiment that you're uh, uh, in, uh, implying, where we, we try and do like horse to, to elephant or some, ar some arbitrary combinations of objects. Uh, we tried even like very strange things like dog to fire hydrant, right? Uh, under the idea that, well, it will just work. Uh, and, and the truth is that it's, it's not very robust. So it works in certain situations, uh, but because it's very dependent upon the appearance variation of the foregrounds with respect to the backgrounds, the, the unsupervised approach, right? It relies on the fact that the foregrounds don't vary in appearance that much, but the backgrounds do vary in appearance more than the foregrounds. Um, so it's quite hard to get it to work on arbitrary classes, um, which is why then we say those segmentation masks that come out are like, it's conceptually a good idea. Uh, practically, it's quite hard to, to get to work in, in generic cases. And so we, here we start with the supervised masks. And is it possible just to get rid of this supervision even weak? Um, we tried solving this like end to end without the distinction of the intermediate step in the middle. And that's also quite hard. So mm -hmm. I can show you some results for like other methods that try and do this end to end. I think Hong tries to do this end to end. So let's see, this is our result. This is the method from Hong. Uh, it was like a year earlier. Um, and I, they try to generate the whole intermediate region uh, within the bounding box uh, without first estimating the shape. And there it becomes very difficult for them to produce the right shape because there is sufficient texture in the region that they generate to fool the discriminator still. Uh, this discriminator is not really strongly cued on shape. So this is why that explicit factorization factorization uh, is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Interesting, because it's so obvious for us, where is the, uh, like, the yeah. background and background is so, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no problem and for networks and everything. It's like, it's obvious at all. Okay, I, de I, def I definitely agree. It's, it, it seems like it's the thing we should, you know, the network should be able to do, but they can't. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So what have we done? Uh, we've gained this like 2D shape and, po shape and uh, texture generator right, from our 2D masks. Right. But in your heads, you're probably thinking, well, this is, this is such a hack, right? Why do I want this to be 2D? Uh, I know that objects aren't really 2D and the pose variation is kind of random. I said I had this like latent noise vector that I could sample, but that doesn't feel very convincing. Um, and yeah, that's true. We felt the same way. Uh, but really what we're asking for is uh, like to learn to reconstruct and generate like three dimensional objects from, from 2D images uh, where these 2D images are in the wild, right? In all of those complicated ways that we described at the beginning uh, with all of this pose appearance variation, right? This is very difficult. And we don't have any supervision for the three-dimensionalness of the objects or the pose of the objects. They don't, that supervision source just doesn't exist. We have to go out and find that. Right. So imagine we still wanted to generate objects, but we wanted to be able to pose them in, in 3D and then pose them by changing the like orientation of the neck or the legs of, of the giraffe, right? This fine, finer level of control. We need some kind of intermediate representation to be able to constrain this variation and control the generation process. Right? It's a bit like we want like an artist's mannequin for the object, right? Where I can like repose the thing and have this like little structure that allows me to con to constrain the problem. Okay, so that's our goal. This is the the final bit of work. We want to make or infer make and infer, I guess, the artist's mannequin uh, without any supervision for a particular object. 
So I'm going to take in RGB images and masks, so silhouettes. Right? And the variation that I'm going to see in those images is going to have a varying 3D camera. It's going to have varying object pose. And it's also going to have varying scene illumination. Right? So our goal is to learn this intermediate posable 3D representation to help with this 2D generation task. OK, so this is work. Uh, that should be on archive uh, fairly soon. Uh, so it's called the uh, controllable image synthesis with uh, 3D Gaussians from unposed silhouettes. And on the right hand side here, you can see what it is we want to recover. These are our like representations of this artist's mannequin, and they are three dimensional Gaussians from the title here. And I can rotate them to spin them around. And then each of them individually, I can manipulate. I can make them bigger or smaller. I can move them in 3D space. I can rotate them too. And this is like me moving the joints of the, the object around. Right? But the only, the only supervision I have is silhouettes and the fact that it spins around. The, I'm going to see this object under different poses. OK, so I have a bunch of silhouettes that come in of an object. And then I'm going to predict this like 3D Gaussian proxy or rig, you could call it. Okay. And then I'm going to, from that 3D Gaussian proxy, try to reconstruct those input silhouettes. In this way, it's, it's almost like a shape from silhouette problem, where the pose of the object varies as well as uh, the camera. And, and I also don't know the camera's locations. And then I'm going to take the texture from the object's RGB and combine it with this intermediate 3D Gaussian proxy to give me control over the view, the three-dimensional camera view, uh, the pose of the object, uh, and some of its shape controls. And then I'm going to have this like interactive system to be able to get better object stamps. So here's an example. Um, here we go. So I'm going to draw the bounding box, and it's going to make my rig of Gaussians. And then I can manipulate this sort of rig of Gaussians to rotate the, the camera. And then I can pick any particular Gaussian within this representation and move it around, manipulate it a little bit, uh, and then change the output generated image. Let's see that again. Okay, so on the output on the right there, the giraffe turns around, uh, and then we want to make its neck like reach towards the trees to eat something. Uh, there we go. Here's another example. And in this one, we want the giraffe to look the other way, so we manipulate its neck. Uh, and then it ends up uh, looking to the right. So let's talk about how this is done at a high level. So we have this three-dimensional representation of Gaussians, but the only supervision we have are these two-dimensional masks, right? So M here is our mask, and G is our sort of Gaussian mannequin that we that we talked about right so first off to be able to cope with the fact that each object that we see in m is under a slightly different pose what we're going to do is predict a set of what we call canonical gaussians these are the object under no pose variation as if it were uh, in a in a fixed pose, a fixed canonical pose. And uh, we take the style gain approach here and have uh, a const that is fed into uh, some fully connected layers that get trained to produce this like, like canonical 3D representation. Then given some instance mask M, we encode this into uh, 
per instance and then per Gaussian transforms that will change the canonical. So we estimate some camera rotation, which is to say, which view am I looking at these Gaussians from, from my input mask. And then I estimate uh, transforms, scale translation rotation for each of the individual Gaussians that will repose this canonical model into uh, the pose that is visible in the instance. So then I have uh, a set of 3D Gaussians that represent the object as seen in M, the, the posed version of the object as seen in M, as different from the, the canonical, which is like this unposed version. Then I'm going to project these 3D Gaussians down to 2D using a, a differentiable projection model. And then I'm going to pass these into a generator that's going to produce uh, M prime, which is the reconstruction of M. And this process is sufficient to train, uh, to learn uh, a, a mannequin that represents the mask, producing G, something that looks like G. How, how do we get this to be 3D? Right, uh, G the generator G M could just do anything, right? Or this gener this encoder E M. Uh, how does it make a three D space from this representation? Uh, this is where we have self supervision. So, given the Gaussians, I'm going to apply a random rotation to them in three D, uh, a random three D rotation. Then I'm going to generate a mask from those, and that's going to produce me M hat prime, right? Which is uh, what we see here on the right. So on the left, it is the same object as in M, but under a different rotation. And we're going to discriminate M hat prime to say that also looks real. And then from M hat prime, we're going to again predict what those 3D Gaussians were that underlied it undo the random rotation that I had applied originally, and then say that uh, I must end up with the same Gaussians as I started with. So I get the Gaussians, I say, oh, under any arbitrary random rotation, they must also make a mask that looks like a real version of the object. And when I rotate that, when I then generate Gaussians from this one and rotate that back, it must be self-consistent. Right? Uh, this helps enforce that the shape is the space that is inferred is actually a three-dimensional space. OK, there you go. Um, here is how we do for time. Is a few more examples of uh, editing that you can do with this. Now, I'll say that as this plays out, yes, Issa picked a different, uh, a different background so that you can see that the lighting gets adjusted uh, with the texture generation that we had on top. Um, I'll say that right now, this is working on like some constrained version of synthetic data that we generate ourselves. So here you go. In this case, we render out, because there's so much variation in Coco, we render out a, a you know, pretty realistic data set of giraffe and then try to uh, infer this model on that version. Uh, the, and what you're seeing is those results here. The quality that we get on Coco is less right now, uh, but uh, we're working towards improving, improving that uh, representation to be able to factor more of this variation. Uh, but the idea is sound, I think, in that uh, when we try to infer the mannequin on the Coco data, it also does a pretty good job. Okay, so, uh, so there you go. That's uh, the last thing that I, we were going to talk about today, which is this idea of how you can infer three-dimensional uh, control structures from unsupervised uh, data by enforcing the structure of this self-supervision, this, this random rotation, and then also this canonical model of the object to constrain the pose variation through the process. Is this going to be open-sourced? 
uh, yeah, when it's accepted somewhere. <laughs> right. right now, it's like work in progress. But, um, but yeah. Okay, so I will stop there. Today, we have talked about learning controls through structure for generating handwriting, uh, which Hatsi talked about using this DSD idea. Uh, and then I mostly talked about generating giraffes through unstructured segmentation and then uh, un, sorry, unsupervised segmentation and then unsupervised uh, three-dimensional Gaussian estimation for uh, making this control rig or artist's mannequin for the generation process. Aaron had a question. How do you infer the number of Gaussians for a particular class? It's a great question. And the answer is we, we eyeball it. I'm going to show you a slide for what happens as you change K. K is the number of Gaussians, OK? For the giraffe, we just said, eh, maybe six. <laughs> uh, here's an example of uh, another domain that we have. Uh, this one is Manuel. At the bottom, you see the reconstructed mask. And at the top, you see the inferred Gaussians as K increases. So we see that K, as K increases, it, it looks more and more like an anatomical structure, right? So like big plus, like we're, we're probably on the right lines, right? Uh, and then at the bottom, you also see that the mask is reconstructed with more coherence, I guess you could say, uh, as k increases. So that also leads us to believe that we're on the right on the right lines. You can also see that it doesn't exactly look human, right? There's some weird things going on when k is at twelve, right? One leg has more detail than the other leg, right? Uh, and the arms don't come out so well, right? So this is a subtlety about the data and then the losses. If the data doesn't include the, the pose variation, then the Gaussian will never be learned to represent it. Right? So in this particular data set, uh, the, the, the uh, geometry, the object, uh, performs a dance. And the left leg undergoes more pose variation than the right leg. And so its Gaussian representation is fuller, if you like, than, than the other one. Uh, and then why the arms? The arms take up less area in each of the images than the legs. And so they are represented uh, later in their sophistication. Yeah. So yeah, the data set must include the pose variation that a human could undergo, uh, and then that because this is all 2D, all derived from 2D, it's based on the, the cost that's associated with the two-dimensional projection of those gases. Uh, you're welcome, Herman. Thanks for coming. Any other questions, anybody? Uh so just i remember there was some work uh, with uh, uh, optical flow but uh, uh with the constraint that uh, most of the objects are like uh, rigid motions uh it seems that this has somehow related am i right and it was uh, actually for people so the title was uh, to split people to uh, parts that are like rigid uh, rigid bodies so like uh, rigid parts Right, right, right. Um, I'm going to say yes. So there's quite a few works that try to do unsupervised parts based segmentation mm -hmm. based on motion in data. Yeah. Um, the particular contribution here is to say that we try to represent like areas through these 3D Gaussian model mm -hmm. uh, and that the model that we derive is, is three-dimensional itself. So it's not a two-dimensional model that underpins the representation, it's three-dimensional. And that's pretty rare. There are other 
like voxel based approaches for trying to do this kind of generation task like hologan or platonic gan but they don't really factor the pose um so i think that's the distinction yeah and uh, another question is like maybe uh, i just uh, i didn't read the book but uh, there are like star models in uh, classic computer vision where you not only just model, uh, the, for example, for faces, you have eyes, nose, and so on, but uh, there are also spring models that tell that the eyes can't be too far away from nose. Do you have something like this one in your Gaussian mixture model? Or? Yeah, there's an implicit loss that says that we want like a good dis like distribution of Gaussians over the space, right? None of them should be too small. None of them should be too large, right? Uh, this works very well for like articulated things like like the giraffe. Um, let me show you a couple more examples of things that we do. Um, uh, let's see. So I showed you the giraffe, I showed you the human. Uh, we can do this like this bee-like object. That works pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to things that don't have that kind of the same kind of articulation, uh, this is what it does for a tree. So you can see that it puts sort of it puts mass or, or stuff, it puts density, uh, Gaussian density, uh, to, to fill the three-dimensional space of the of the tree. Yeah. But yeah, we have those those kinds of constraints. Yeah. It's really nice. It's amazing. Thanks. Thank you. All right, any other questions? But uh, uh, training is on synthetic data. It means that illumination is almost the same one. So we're actually, actually, no. So you're right that it's trained on synthetic, uh, but we uh, we vary the illumination at uh, mm -hmm. generation time. So we have uh, 10 different uh, illuminations. So uh, on the right hand side here, you see some of the illumination variation that is learned for the generated model. Mm. So, so no, we we factor that. Sorry, we we have to factor that at generation time. Yeah, mm. but it's a good question. Okay, thank you. And I think this example here was, so that's the, on the right hand side, that's the giraffe that's generated with that particular background. And then uh, when we load a different background, uh, we get a different giraffe. We still can like sample some like uh, approximate lighting condition for the giraffe, but uh, yeah, it looks um, like it approximately matches the background. All right, thanks everybody for your super patience today. We, we, we brought a lot of stuff and we appreciate you hanging around and um, listening to uh, all of our silly ideas. No, no, I don't, don't, don't think the silly is the right word here. It's interesting. Yeah. I have ask the last question. And uh, yeah. do you think that uh, this is the method uh, to go uh, forward with it? So is it like in the limit? Because uh, if you think about real world, it's difficult, like, uh, so what is uh, different objects? Each of them, uh, like, uh, uh, should have, uh, should be represented with Gaussian mixture. You also, it's difficult to decide what is the number and flexibility of the object can be different. So do you think that this is the way to go to understand the world? Uh, so like uh, uh, some uh, application to edit something, it's some, but, if you want really to 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 find uh, how the world is uh, generated, do you think that it is a, a good gen generative model in in the long run? That's a great question. Um, let's think about the like the ideal kind of supervision, right? We talked about this spectrum of supervision, right? where at one end you have almost no supervision at all, and the amount of things that you can do. Are, are quite limited and then at the other end you have like really really detailed supervision and you can do all kinds of things if you have that um 
it's it's definitely true that there's this gap between you know what is true what is the truth of an object and uh what you can recover reasonably as a as an intermediate model and i think the right way to think about this work is that it shows uh, a direction for what you could do um, not necessarily that it is exactly the ideal thing yet um, it's definitely clear that object individual objects might be okay with this but object classes uh, object classes often show more variation in their shape than this would allow right and so you'd need to add extensions to this model that would allow you to like add or remove gaussians for any particular instance which is a hard combinatorial problem um, the shape variation might not be sufficient that's represented here um, one of the limitations if you like or uh, features if you want to be generous is that the fine shape detail is not represented in the model it's intentionally left to this 2d generation step which is like a halfway to the to the truth right we don't have this fine detail shape but that fine detail shape is really important and it would be great if you could recover it right but right now it's quite hard to see how you would recover that in an unsupervised way so it's always this trade-off about uh how much you can push the, the generalizability uh in a useful way right uh versus how much supervision you have to be able to solve the problem yeah does that help get across our like uh, how we think about this work? Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, 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 yes, uh, but you have another book, yes, so like uh, this Matryoshka and so on. I don't know. Oh, yeah. And uh, like when you have a lot of images uh, taken from different characters and you can create uh, from another viewpoint. Uh, That's true. Give uh, MSI uh, technique. Uh, so. Right, right. But as soon as you have more information, you can start to do more complicated things. So an another way to think about this Gaussian work is that we're also working out where the camera is implicitly, right? Lots of works in reconstruction assume that you know where the cameras are in the problem. And we're saying that when you have just a bunch of images from an in the wild source like Coco, you, you don't know where the cameras are. And so that limits a lot of the things that you can do. Uh, if you like, you can think about it as like an object centric camera calibration mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a very loose, a very loose way. Um, so we're, we're also implicitly solving. Actually, we have an explicit representation for the camera. So we're, we're explicitly solving um, some like cheap or loose camera calibration when we solve this problem as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Thank you. I think we're also running out of time. Um, Atsu and James, thank you for this talk today. Extremely elaborate stuff. Very nice. Thanks very much. You're, you're very welcome. And might be, um, I know Ina actually approached me before this talk. Um, she asked about Matryoshka also. Um, oh, yeah. if it, it would be in the talk or if we could do another talk about that um and we could discuss this offline to see if something is doable around this or not sure sure um, yeah i'd be happy to talk about the like 3d reconstruction stuff that we do as well yeah i would actually be very curious to hear about this um while you were talking i was thinking more and more about this direction so we will talk offline we'll see what we can do for sure um, in the meantime, everybody, I will say again, thanks. Um, thank you um, again, James and Atsu for uh, giving us the talks. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, we will publish everything, the recording and the references in the coming days. And I will say um, bye. And until the next time. Thanks everybody.